I'm gonna go live and then we'll see if this is the same. Um, can you tell me the URL of it? Um, What's the URL say for what I just sent you? Should I say it out loud? Yeah, it's like, does it end with like THW? No, SE. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm just gonna like okay. share this with you because like it's a new, um, it's a new thing. Do people know the new link? No, so can you do that for me? Like, po like email them and stuff. Ooh, I'm just going to send it. Oh, okay. Um, can't use my okay, well, I'll just like quickly... Um, someone's... Who sent this? Was this... Oh, that was someone else. That was Bilal. Um... <laughs> um, okay, so apparently I have to also open it. How can I open the chat? I don't actually know how to open the chat. Or well, maybe it's already open. Who knows? Can people... Um, oh yeah, are you on... Have you done it to... Um, Facebook? Like, have you updated the Facebook? No, where was it on Facebook? On push buttons. On the event or on the... Just like in the page. It's okay, I can do it. Yes. You already on it or... Yeah, it's okay. All right. Um, so I've I've emailed, and I've just also updated the Facebook. So hopefully people will know. Um, okay. Um, I think we just have to wait until. Hello, hello. Also, I'm going to see if there's actually anyone in here right now. It's two watching, so that might be just me and you. <laughs> me? Yeah, yeah. Are you on the are you on YouTube? No. No. Can you just can you just check if this is actually streaming right now? Okay, let me just um cuz I don't know like um Bilal actually just messaged, um, emailed us saying like, uh, we have to apparently enable the chat or something. Um, so you changed the, 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 edit, the post that you put up an hour ago? You changed yeah. the link of it? You edited the link? Yeah, so I had, to, I had to change the link because like for some reason, yeah, I, I just messed something up. So I had to, I had to change it. Um, so now I'm now opening it. Yeah. It's working. Oh wait, it's now gone. So I need it. Okay, let's try again. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm live currently. Wait, is this what you just said? I think so. That might be the old one though. Yeah, that's the old one. Oh, no, that was fucking... That was it. 
It was just the preview was giving me something else. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, I think I'm I think I'm live. <laughs> No, that's the old, yeah, that's the old one. So is the good, the right link on Facebook now? Because I clicked on the Facebook link. Yeah, I put the, I put the right one on Facebook. No, the new one. I mean, yeah, it's, it's on Facebook. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's right now. Okay, I'm going to say hello, hello, one, two, three, and ask if everyone can hear that. Yeah. Um, so you sure it's the right link now? Yeah. Because people are um, responding. So I think there's just like a little bit of latency and that's it. Um, but as soon as someone responds, I'm just going to start. Yeah, sorry, everyone. I'm not... This is the first time I've ever streamed anything, so... <laughs> I'm not getting a live stream when I click the link, but only... Okay, cool. Everyone is everyone's got it. All right. Um welcome everyone. Sorry that there is a bit of lag um with comments. I th I feel like that's always a thing. Um any like live stream I've heard like they're always complaining about the lag. But, okay, so, um, I guess, yeah, I don't know how many people are actually here right now or how many people were going to attend, but I might just, um, I might just start introducing and talking about what we're going to do today. So, where are we? Okay. So, um, just to start, uh, yeah, my name is Tigran, um, I'm uh, working with push buttons and um, yeah, we're a DIY initiative that is focusing on um, giving uh, free or accessible workshops for people who are underrepresented in the music scene. Um, so, you know, uh, like people who might be of lower class, refugee status, um, people of color, LGBT plus, uh, women, other political minorities, etc. Um, we've already done one workshop before, um, and now we're doing the second part. In the first part, we did some EQ and some compression, and um, those were the two main things we were kind of um, focusing on learning. Uh, so what we actually um, have here now is um, I've opened up mixing workshop to start session so that can be for like uh, I think everyone should have downloaded that by now um, uh, if you have just open that up and um, yeah like when you open that up with Reaper it will ask you to um, browse for missing files and you just have to go in and um, locate that um, it's just the exact same audio files that we had last week. Um, yeah. So uh, this is actually an updated session. So I've gone through and everything that we've learned, um, I've actually um, uh, applied it the way that I would if I was mixing. So obviously last time we were mixing in a big club at Oki with a huge club stereo system. That's, um, it's always going to be quite, uh, bassy, um, because they've got like huge subwoofers that are just like pumping out music that's supposed to move you and get you to dance. Right. Um, but obviously most speaker systems are not going to be that way. And, um, so we have to mix things differently, um, because now we're in like a more, uh, you know, uh, typical kind of an environment like I'm using my studio headphones here um, usually I'd be using studio monitors which are basically just speakers um, that are uh, really good quality and uh, represent the music as neutrally as possible um, 
so yeah like we're able to actually hear hear the music as it really sounds you know or you know as close to it as possible um so here so i've got like um a bunch of uh eq and compression on all of these tracks and i've also actually added a few extra tracks to help us with what we're going to be working on today so today we're going to be doing reverb delay and modulation effects and then ah, oh, and also saturation effects and then at the end we're actually going to be putting all of that together and creating a telephone effect for one of the parts of the of the song so yeah um i'm not sure how good the quality is but I might just um, play this for you now, just so you can have a listen to where I've got the mix up to at this point um, and where you should have yours also. I'll just check to see if anyone's responded, saying anything in the chat. Nope, everything's good. Okay, cool. Let's hear. <laughs> So as this playing, I'm going to just go through and tell you a few things. So here yeah, with the um, with the symbols, I've actually um, boosted up quite a bit of low frequency. If you um, if you remember last week, we talked about bell uh, EQ shapes. So I've boosted up with a bell shape. Um, about six and a half decibels at uh, 200 hertz. So I'm just going to show you again what that's actually doing um, because uh, this is actually quite important. There's there's a lot of like uh, really nice low frequencies that come out of the snare drum that are present in the overheads, but they're not quite present in the close snare drum microphone um, because the close microphone is like right next to the skin and the drum is hitting so hard, like the low frequencies don't actually have enough space above the skin to develop before they hit the microphone. So they're kind of developing after the microphone, you know? So like, if this is the snare drum skin, this is the microphone, this is like, you know, maybe where the, um, the bass frequencies, like the lower frequencies of the snare drum are gonna be coming through. So I'll just show you what that actually sounds like. It's this bit here. So that's the fundamental frequency of the snare drum that's coming through. And also I've just rolled off the highest, um, like the airy kind of frequencies, because that was like, it was just a little bit harsh. So I um, took that out. I also put a little bit of a compressor on it as well. That's just um, taking off every time the snare drum hits, it just ducks down on the level just to keep the snare drum a little bit more consistent in the overheads. So you can see here where the cursor is. Every time that that's dipping down is when a snare drum is hitting. Um, snare drum has some compression on it, four to one ratio. Uh, still a very fast attack. This is still considered very rapid attack and um, a medium release, I would say, for this. Um, and that's... Uh, just kind of getting a bit more snap out of the snare drum. So without it, and with it. Notice that there's actually more body coming out of the snare drum when you put a compressor. That's because actually the low frequencies of a snare drum are not at the initial attack. It's not when the stick hits the snare drum, it's when the snare drum sustains. That's where all the body and all the tone of a snare drum is. So when you put a compressor with um, these kinds of settings, you're actually uh, having the compressor snap down when the snare drum hits, and then it's releasing as the snare drum is sustaining. So that means that it's actually turning up the level of the sustain while it's actually turning down the level of the attack. So it's it's turning down the level of the attack and turning up the sustain. So that's that's why we're getting more body out of it from this compression, right? Um, and the same with the kick drum. Any kind of a bass heavy instrument, it's good to compress it to some degree because actually uh, bass frequencies take up a lot of space 
when we're uh, hearing things back, like, and they're, they're actually quite difficult for speaker systems to reproduce effectively. So if you have a really consistent um, volume on all of your bass instruments, it's much, much healthier for your speakers and it, uh, it keeps things feeling a lot tighter as well. So I'll show you what the kick drum sounds like. We've got quite a bit of comp compression here. You can see it's about five decibels of compression every time that the kick drum hits. I've got a much slower attack and I've still got a medium um, kind of, you know, medium to medium fast release. Again, we're letting the sustain of the kick drum come up as a result of that, but we've got a slower attack because a, a kick drum is a lower frequency instrument. Faster attacks actually start to distort the kick drum. And I can actually show you what that sounds like. So if I, this is a much more dirty sounding kick now. As opposed to this. Now it's a lot tighter, you know. Um, cool. And here on the drum bus, I've actually got a compressor, which is working in a really interesting way. So, um, I'm just going to show you what's actually going on. So, see here we've got a control saying dry gain and wet gain. Um, these are uh, two different volumes of two different signals, right? So wet gain is actually the drums after they've been compressed. Um, and wet gain means it's the volume of the compressed signal, right? Um, the dry gain is um, the unaffected signal. So we've got affected level and unaffected level. So we can actually turn this down completely and turn this up to zero and hear what this compressor itself is doing. Um, Notice that the attacks are very quiet now and every time a uh, drum hits, you can hear the sustain swelling up right after. And we're actually hearing a lot of the room sound of the drums as well because um, the room is gonna be obviously the sustain, right? Yeah. And what I had before was a mixture between these two. So I turned this down a little bit and turned up the dry. Right. So this is what it was actually at. I'll show you what it sounds like without it. Off. On. Let's hear it in a mix. This is on. Now off. Notice it's like the drums disappear. Some hits you can hear, some you can't hear so well. Now it's on. Now we can hear every single thing that's being played. The reason is because the compressed signal is, um, it's so heavily compressed that uh, once I'm bringing it back in and blending it with the dry signal, um, you're hearing Anytime the, the dry would be dropping out and not being audible in the mix, the wet is actually there and it's keeping it strong, okay? So it's like anytime one drops off, the other one is in its place to show you. Um, so that's actually something called parallel compression that we didn't talk about last week. Um, it's a really important thing to know. Um, okay, cool. Hello, Thara. Okay. Um, so uh, another one that I compressed extremely heavily was the bass. And this is actually something that um, is a lot of people do, especially with like an acoustic bass, right? Or an electric bass, like something that's not a synthesized bass is going to be um, a lot more inconsistent than a synthesizer bass because you're playing a real instrument, like real strings, depending on where you play it and like... Um, like the position of the string itself and like what uh, fret you're playing it on, it's actually going to change um, the 
the timbre of it. So like the, the tone of the instrument is actually going to change and the level of the low frequencies are going to change. So you can actually like absolutely punish this. You can like put a ridiculous amount of compression on it. Like you notice like, you know, when we were listening back to that, um, uh, the full mix, the bass guitar actually sounded like pretty nice, right? Like let's hear it again. Right, it doesn't sound like it's out of place or anything like that. But um, if I solo it, have a listen to what it what it actually is doing by itself. Just turn it up. This is being like absolutely pummeled. You can see n minus 16 decibels. It's like being turned down 16 decibels every time it's being played. So. So that's that's a an extreme uh, amount of compression, I would say. Um, and guitars just have a bit of EQ that I've applied to them to make it a little bit brighter. You can see it's the higher frequencies here that we were um, I was mostly interested in. Um, a little bit of low mid range dip as well. This one was a little bit muddy and boxy sounding. It needed to be a little bit more vocal. This um, 1.2 kilohertz. It, that's like somewhere that I'm often listening to um, because it's actually like quite important to have in my opinion like a lot of like vocal sounding mid-range in an electric guitar um, and this is just to make it sound a little bit brighter so if we just solo it turn down the EQ this is what it was like before and with it now it's subtle, the difference, but you can hear it. It's like, it's like someone uh, uh, lit a torch, and like you can see the you can see the guitar a little bit better or something. Um, and the vocals, uh, yeah, I um, basically have kept it more or less the same as what we had at at the workshop. Just a little bit of uh, high frequencies to get it um, a little bit brighter, and um, just the exact same uh, compression as we had. Um, yeah, cool. Um, if anyone has any questions as we're going um, or like comments, can you please, um, uh, yeah, uh, just let me know in the chat. Okay, I guess the sound quality of a YouTube stream is not that high, so probably when you want to show difference switching on and off, we don't hear as well as you do. Uh, okay, sure. Well, I'm actually going to also upload the um, lossless version of this uh, tutorial um, after today so you'll be able to hear it a lot better so you can go back and watch it again so sorry if um yeah i don't know how what the quality of the stream is unfortunately it says excellent connection but <laughs> who knows what that actually means okay so on to what we're going to do today so we're going to start with reverb so i've got um uh, written here i've got this like uh this slideshow that i've uh, put into the folder that everyone has been shared um, in um, in the email. Uh, so you can go through and like read this and also you can just sort of Google this sort of stuff as well. So I've written here, Reverb mimics the acoustic ambience of lively spaces of different sizes from a bathroom to a cathedral. So you can actually hear it now in um, in this room as I'm talking. There's like a, there's like a ambience to it, right? After every sound, you hear the room kind of, you know, talking back. So if I clap, you can hear like the sound of the room um, quite loud. Um, whereas if I had it more, you know, uh, acoustically treated in here, which I haven't actually done in this room yet, um, you would be able to uh, hear it much closer. It wouldn't have as much reverb, basically. Um, so we're going to be using digital reverb to mimic these kinds of spaces. Um, so yeah, I've, I've said like, you know, different sizes from a bathroom to a cathedral, obviously like, you know, um, there's different, uh, lengths in the reverberation of a bathroom versus in a cathedral. Like if you sing a note in a cathedral, the, uh, reverb length is going to be considerably longer than in a bathroom. So there's a few, um, a few parameters that we need to know about when we're using reverb in, um, 
in mixing. So one of them is size slash time. So a lot of these parameters have two different names, different plugin companies will use different names for the same thing. Um, size and time, basically, um, it's just how long is the, the reverb tail going to go on for. Um, then there's dampening, which shortens the length that the high frequencies reverberate, which means like um, lower frequencies will be reverberating longer than higher frequencies. So to give an example, if, you, if you're in a cathedral and you sing the word so, right, the s, the sibilance, the s, is going to be a shorter reverb than the o, because the o has more lower frequencies in it. So um, you can use dampening in a reverb to um, create that. Um, some reverbs have chorus or mod or spin. These are three different words that describe the exact same thing. Um, this applies modulation to the reverb. Modulation is something that we're going to talk about in depth later on today, so you don't have to worry about this, this word too much, but basically it's, it's something that makes it sound a little bit more watery, um, you could say. So it just sort of like changes the timbre at, uh, um, at a specific pace. And then there's a very important one that is often overlooked, uh, pre-delay. So pre-delay, um, uh, delay is actually something we're also going to go in depth um, after this, but pre-delay is uh, in a reverb, it's like how long after um, the signal has come through the reverb does the reverb itself wait before it applies um, the reverb itself to the signal? So um, I'll give you an example. I'm going to load up, uh, I'm going to solo this vocal. We're going to go to the verse and I'm going to open up um, Pro R. So anyone that's new, um, what I've actually done is I've clicked this button here that's solo and it's to the lead vocal um, which is uh, the seventh um, track. And um, that means that only this track is going to be playing through now. And I've just clicked up around here, any of these boxes that are blank, um, you can click it and you'll, op you'll get this dialog box. And I'm gonna find Fab Filter Pro R and I'm gonna open that up. So this is the reverb plugin. Um, there's also a mix. You can mix between unaffected and affected. So I'm just going to have it halfway, so 50% mix. And we're going to have a listen to what it sounds like. One night I'm balanced with a quiet peace. So this is quite long. This is shorter. In this plugin, the um, yeah size or time is actually called space. <laughs> space and time. Whatever. Um, so this is for a smaller space. This is for a larger space. And you can also see in the middle, it tells you how long the reverb is. 1.77 seconds if it's here, 0.2 seconds if it's here, 10 seconds if it's over there. So that's for like a cathedral sound. So this is sounds like a closet. It sounds more like a living room or a large bathroom. This is more like a large hall. Now we're getting into cathedral territory. Okay. I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to show you what pre-delay sounds like. I'm going to turn this up. Now you can hear... You're hearing the unaffected signal first, and then the affected reverberated signal is 198 milliseconds later, as I've said it now. So this is quite an extreme example, just to give you an exact, just to give you an idea of what it's what it's actually doing. Um, basically, what you're doing is you're getting the uh, reverberation out of the way of the dry signal to make it sound more um, articulate because reverb obviously sounds very washy and it can easily sound a bit too messy and too murky. So you can use a little bit of pre-delay to um, get it out of the way of the dry signal so a vocal can still sound articulate. You can hear all of the words that she's singing. So um, yeah, but then you still have reverb because it's after. One night I'm 
So listen to the difference between the clarity of this and this. Now you can hear you can hear her a, a little bit clearer. So that's something to keep in mind. I usually go between like um, 40 milliseconds and like sometimes even up to 150 milliseconds, depending on um, what the song is wanting. So I'm just going to put, um, I'm gonna actually going to take that off. Um, you can hold Alt and click on a plugin to delete it. Um, so I'm just deleting it there. We've actually got a, a track, track five here that is dedicated to um, uh, just like the full reverb signal. So I'm actually going to open up Pro R on that channel. So track five has Pro R and I'm keeping the mix on 100% here. And what I'm going to do is bring this up to zero. So this fader is now at zero, um, also known as Unity, um, zero Unity. Um, basically means that you're not changing the volume of it. Um, and this is already sent to it. So I've already, um, I've already uh, arranged it and routed it and everything so that it's already sending to this. Um, so I'm going to um, show you what this sounds like now. One night on balance with earth wide peace The right. prophet spread works about So now you can now we're hearing only the reverb, right? Cool. So now we've got two, um, two faders, one for your vocal and you've got one for your uh, reverb. But you've actually got a third um, volume control. This control here, you can see it says Vox verb. I don't know if the video quality is good enough, but it's just in um, the send section of the um, of channel seven, uh, track seven. Um, there's a small uh, circle on the right side of Vox verb, that like rectangle there. So this is the send level. It basically means like how much volume are you sending to track five, Vox verb. Um, you can take that circle and you can click and drag it down until it's negative infinity, which means it's off. It's not sending anything. Or you can turn it up to plus 12 decibels. So um, we're going to start with negative infinity. We're going to um, unsolo this. We're going to listen to it in context of the whole uh, mix. And I'm going to start bringing it in until I like the level. So I'm turning it up. Okay, at negative six, I'm starting to hear it. I think it's a bit too much now though. Okay, I actually, I like things relative, relatively dry, not reverberated. Um, I like the sound of, you know, just like really good EQ, really good compression. Um, and only a, as much reverb as is necessary to give it a sense of space. Um, I kind of, you know, I grew up in the 90s and I listened to a lot of, um, you know, 90s grunge music. And um, uh, even like, you know, like, uh, like, like 80s, like, you know, death metal and stuff like that. Like a lot of my favorite um, albums actually didn't have that much reverb on it. You know, like there's obviously like a bunch of grunge mu music and heavy metal that has like a like a wash of reverb that's put on it. But like the stuff that I was listening to um, didn't have that much. So um, yeah, that's just like the way that my taste my taste personally developed. You know, and when I listen to this kind of music, it it reminds me of that. Like this band is obviously quite influenced by Tool. Um, and like, uh, yeah, Tool, you know, like uh, a lot of their albums, like Anima, uh, for example, didn't have a whole lot of uh, reverb applied to um, instruments, only just enough to give it a sense of, of space and the third dimension so it doesn't sound too claustrophobic and choked, right? So this sounds pretty good to me for the vocal. Let's go up to the chorus. Let's hear what it sounds like there. That sounds pretty good to me. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty good. Is anyone got any questions about re reverb on um, reverb on uh, vocals? Um, you can you can ask me. Um, I'll just quickly show you as well. Uh, I've got Vox Reverb send here here as well on the double track of um, of the lead vocal, which comes in when she sings this part. So that's two performances of the exact same line for um, uh, yeah for the uh, for just those two uh, lines of lyrics. Um, so yeah, like I've just got a little bit on that as well, just to give it a bit more dimension too. And I've got a little bit on the backing vocals. That's like so that's like a harmony that they put in there. Um, yeah. So uh, if you have like lower volume on the fader but higher send on the um on the send volume here um it makes it sound like it's further away right so if i if i put this on so this sounds like a lot further away right um so i'm making it basically uh have like this sense of depth so like some of the vocals are drier, so it feels like it's closer to you, and they're louder, um, so it feels like it's actually like physically closer to you. And then like the backing vocals, I've got more reverb because I want them to sit further back in the mix and give this sense of like like a like a three dimensional depth. Um, okay, uh, there's another element that actually, uh, in my opinion, needs uh, reverb really badly. Um, doesn't need too much of it, but um, it's uh it's just popping out a little bit too much for me the snare drum so if you have a listen to especially um let's go from the um intro it sounds good it's like you know like it's got the right eq it's got the right compression it's got the right volume it's balanced really nicely because we did all of our mix preparation in the last session um but it just sort of it just is a bit obnoxious for me it just keeps on jumping out a little bit too um, abruptly and then disappearing too ab abruptly as well. And actually, if we look at the drum room, which is the last track we've got, track 39, if I solo that, there's not that much. There's a lot more cymbals, you know, like you hear the wash of the cymbals more than you hear like the, um, the tail of a snare drum echoing in the room, for example, right? Um, so yeah, this is a very common issue in uh, in drums because uh, we try to make them sound uh, natural and live, but the snare drum's always going to need a little bit of help in that regard. So I'm actually going to put in an instance of Pro R on just that channel itself. And what I'm gonna do, I'm just, so I don't often solo things this much. This is just so um, I can explain things to you really easily. Again, I'm just going to bring this down to 50% mix, just so we can hear both the dry signal and the wet signal. And I'm going to show you something. So, for snare drums, right, we need a reverb that's going to give it a sense of space, but we don't want it to sound like, you know, like it's the 1980s or whatever. At least I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking too normatively. <laughs> But this is plenty right here. Now actually, this parameter here, brightness, I've turned that up because I want that high frequency to sustain a little bit longer. So this is like, um, we talked about uh, damping. You know, dampening is like one of the uh, parameters that I was saying was an important parameter to know about. Uh, yeah, so brightness is... Um, yeah, they're always using different names, but they do the exact same thing. So brightness is just like how, you know, how long do the high frequencies go for? Um, we're not going to look at all this stuff here because um, that's just too complicated for um, for this workshop. Um, this goes extremely in depth and it's very, very cool. Um, you can get some really crazy sounds out of it. It's really good for like experimental music and stuff like that. Um, 
but yeah, it's also like really useful. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother. This is like a really good setting and I'm not going to explain what these things do either. Most reverb effects do not have this. This is like a unique thing to this specific plugin. Um, okay. So I've only, I'm only using 0.85 seconds of reverb time and, uh, I'm just going to put this into the mix, turn this mix knob down, unsolo this and then start bringing it in until I start hearing enough of it that I feel satisfied. That's a bit too much now. I always like to take it just to the point where it's a little bit too far so that I know where too far is and then bring it back down until I feel like it's good. Great. Sounds much better to me now. So it's not popping out as much as it was before. So, um, cool. Uh, so that's reverb. Uh, if anyone has any questions about reverb, please, um, ask. Okay. Let's see. I wonder about reverb on guitar because I do that a lot and also bass guitar. Okay, cool. Um, reverb. Yeah. I, um, I love reverb on guitar. I prefer to use um, uh, like a reverb pedal. So like if I'm producing for a band, I'll, you know, and there's a part in the song that the guitarist actually wants to have a lot of reverb. I would say, you know, like, let's get your, um, let's get your pedal board if you have one um, and see like, you know, how you would play it live. And they would play that live and I mean, like they would uh, play it in the rehearsal room, you know, live for me so I could have an idea of it. And then I could start thinking about it a little bit more um, critically. Like I could be like, not critically as in like criticizing, but like, you know, like critical thinking kind of uh, critically. Um, and I'd be thinking, what's this going to sound like when it's put into a record? How will it translate? Um, so often you'll end up actually dialing back the reverb a little bit. Um, so it's a little bit more dry mix because... Oftentimes, guitarists will use reverb um, alongside like a clean signal or something like that. And you'll often be compressing a clean signal, which means that once you've compressed it, the reverb sound itself is actually going to be louder. Because remember, like I said before, the reverb is in the tail in, and it's not in the attack of a signal. So um, yeah, it's going to bring up all the sustain, all of the tail of the reverb. So that's why, um, yeah, I'd often get them to do it themselves. But you can do that yourself as well. Um, I, yeah, I would just experiment with it. If you have the resources, it's really nice to actually um, have like a, like a reverb uh, pedal that you can use because it sounds a little bit more authentic. Um, and if, if when you're recording, like the guitar amp itself has a spring reverb unit built into it, spring reverbs sound incredible on guitars. Um, they don't sound very good on anything else pretty much, but um, on guitars, they sound very, very good. So um, yeah, I would recommend doing that. And um, yeah, unless you've got a clean guitar part that you need to put a little bit more space into, but this doesn't really, I mean, there is a, a clean guitar part in this song. I'm, yeah, I'm just not gonna bother with it for the sake of brevity today. Um, but I might if I was doing like a proper final mix. Um, Bass guitar obviously doesn't need reverb, um, but yeah, I usually just put it mostly on vocals and snare drums, sometimes on toms as well. But yeah, that's that's my way of doing it, but there's obviously no right or wrong way of doing it. Okay, let's move on to... Um, oh yeah, right, yeah. Um, I've written about some famous reverb types. You can go through and read these. Um, yeah, plate, chamber, and spring are the three main types of, like... Uh, real reverb machines. Um, plate is a huge metal plate suspended in a frame and um, it has like a speaker coil um, or a transducer, whatever you want to call it. They're the same thing, mounted to the center of the plate so that the um, plate is being played as if it's a, a speaker and there's contact microphones on the edge of the plate so they're picking up the sound that you're putting through um, and yeah, they sound really nice. They sound very metallic. Um, and yeah, that's the sound of the 80s, 70s, even 80s, 90s. And now we have digital versions of the same thing. Um, 
chamber is just like they put a speaker into a um, into a, a lively reverberant sounding room and have a microphone that's in a particularly echoey part of the room and they'll uh, record that. So if you have a, a vocalist and um, you send it out into the bathroom of your house, for example, put a speaker in the bathroom of your house and have a microphone that's also in the bathroom, that's a chamber reverb. Um, and then spring is what we just talked about. Um, okay, let's move on. So um, echo is uh, another extremely important um, uh, and very thoroughly utilized uh, effect that people use in, in mixing and creating music. So uh, think about echo like if you're in a valley and you call out echo and you hear it bouncing back, like echo, echo, echo. That's what an echo effect does, right? Um, and it does that with a, um, yeah, a circuit, basically. Um, so like there's tape echoes, there's also digital echoes. Um, nowadays, it's all pretty much digital stuff. Um, but yeah, they used to actually use tape machines to do this. So what, what it's actually doing is you're sending your signal, your dry signal, into this part here, which is a delay circuit which is actually, um, it records the sound that you've just put in, waits a little while, and then plays it. So it delays the signal, right? Um, that is then split so that the dry, unaffected signal goes out. So this in, that out are the same. But this delay itself also blends into this out as well. Um, so it's mixed in um, to the dry signal. And also, it's split so that the, um, the output of the delay also goes back into the input of the delay. And that is a feedback loop. So I'll show you what I mean. So this feedback loop is kind of the key to it. Um, so let's, again, solo this. I'm actually going to mute the reverb. And we're going to go to a chorus um, just to change things up a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to load up an instance of Timeless 2. That's, uh, that's the um, Echo plugin that uh, I asked you to download the demo of. So I've just gone in, there's this part of it, which is basically a filter for the Echo. Just like take these two, take number one all the way over, number two all the way over to the left. Um, and yeah, I'm actually going to turn these all down. Wait, yeah, I'm gonna turn these all down. So um, just to show you what a single echo without a feedback loop sounds like, right? Let's hear it. Roll the dice, little God, and change the order for entropy. So you can hear there's the dry signal that's playing in real time, and then there's the delayed signal that's mixing into that um, output of the delay. Um, and it's a little bit later. That later is determined by delay time. I can press this button to lock these two. This is basically you've got like on the top half around here. That's for the left channel, what you hear in a left speaker or left headphones. And in this one is for the right. And I've actually pressed this lock button on both of them to make them exactly the same. So what I do to this is gonna affect both of them. And so they're gonna, they're gonna work exactly the same. So you don't have different timing and different feedback um, controls for um, for the different channels, but if I was actually doing this in a in a mix and not in a tutorial, I would be affecting them differently. I'll explain them in a second. But so this changes the time. Let's have a listen to it if it's really long. Right, it's very long now. And then if you have it short, it sounds actually a little bit like a bathroom, like we were saying with shorter reverbs. Roll the dice, little god, and change the order for entropy. Short delay times are um, really important to know about because actually you can use this to um, make things sound like a little bit bigger and a little bit more exciting. Um, so I'm going to show you something now uh, using two different delay times um, on left and right. Okay, so I'm going to un- um, unlock these two. So now the timing feature is disconnected between these two. So this only controls the left-hand side. This only controls the right-hand side. 
Left hand is 32.8 milliseconds of delay time. The right side is I'm going to do almost the same. So I'm going to do, um, let's try 37. Let's see what it sounds like. Roll the dice, little God. Now we actually have two different delay times on the left and right uh, speaker or headphone or whatever. Um, and yeah, like it sounds much wider and it sounds much more exciting. So let's listen to it again. Um, this is just one. Roll the dice, little God. And change the now it's wide. For now mono. For the rules to derange and crumble. Now stereo. For and kings too. So this actually is giving it quite a, a lot of dimension and it's really good. Um, so this is what it sounds like um, with just a single uh, instance of delay, right? But once we start turning up the feedback, let me just show you, I'm going to go to a slower timing to um, bring in some feedback and show you what it sounds like. So you're going to hear more echoes. Roll the dice, little God, and change the order for and you can keep turning this up until it starts feeding back. So if there's zero feedback, there's no, it's not, um, it's not going to be doing any more than just what the delay part of the circuit does. So this part here, it's only doing this. So the feedback loop is not engaged if you've got zero feedback, right? It's just the delay and the delay is being mixed into the um, unaffected signal and coming out of the output. But if you start bringing up that uh, feedback parameter, that's when you're turning this louder and louder and louder. And because eventually we turned it up so loud that it was boosting the volume of the feedback, it starts feeding back positively, right? So it's not dipping down in volume every time it, um, every time it echoes. It's actually increasing in volume every single time because we, we turned that parameter up to plus, you know, positive. Okay, so um, how do we use it on a vocal? Uh, I would do something to the effect of what I did just a moment ago. I use only one, uh, so like no feedback, so it's only one echo. Um, and around about uh, 25 to 30 something. Um, and I unlock this so that it's uh, slightly different. You can do like, yeah, here I've got 58.9, 35.1. That's probably going to sound great. Roll the dice, little guy. And here we've got the dry level, here we've got the wet level, right? Now let's turn it off. This is what it sounds like without. Now on. So that sounds pretty good to me. Um, it's going to sound a lot nicer in the mix too. Let's have a listen to it. Right. So now we're getting another element of dimension, right? Another um, bit of depth in the sound of the vocal. So it's not sounding like this two-dimensional claustrophobic kind of a um, vocal sound. It's sounding much more 3D. So that's cool. Okay. Um, so that's one way you can use delay or echo, sorry. Um, another way you can use it is by sending it out to an echo send. And I'll show you the way that I would do this. So I've already got actually um, uh, echo sends from the track seven, Vox Echo. Um, actually, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and that's the only one. Um, so I'm gonna open up Timeless 2. And again, I'm just gonna uh, open this up completely. I'll show you what this does in a minute. It's basically an EQ. It's an EQ that's only in the feedback um, part of the circuit. So, um, yeah, I'm going to actually play this. Uh, I'm going to turn this echo send down all the way. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, tap tempo for echoes. Tap tempo means you can click this part. This is where the um, timing is showing. Um, actually, let me just see if anyone's got any questions. 
Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so this is where the timing is. Uh, 350 milliseconds it says here. And what I'm actually going to do, you can see, you click it once, it says tap, you click it twice, and it gives you a new number. It's because it actually me measures the timing distance between the first and second click. And that's determining the speed of the echo. So you can actually play back the music. And now I'm gonna actually just like click in time with it. Okay, we got it. Three, three, three. Oops. Cool. So obviously because I'm tapping along to it, it's gonna be a little bit rough, okay? So that's why we've got two different um, two different figures here, but they're more or less the same. Three, 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 four, five. So that's actually good. I want that because um, if they're different timings, it's not gonna sound like the echo is going straight down the middle of the stereo field. It's gonna sound like it's actually wide. And every time it echoes, like every subsequent echo is gonna be further and further out into the stereo field. So it's almost like it's, it's opening up as it echoes. Um, which I like, I like that effect personally. Um, I'm just gonna leave these uh, the same and see what happens. And let's play it and start bringing up the Vox Echo send level. So that's Vox Echo is on channel seven. This send box here, that circle on the, um, on the right hand side of Vox Echo send, that's the volume. I've got it at negative infinity decibels, which means it's off and I'm gonna start bringing it up. Now we're gonna start hearing it in the um, in in track six. Oops. I forgot that I actually had the dry level up around here. You're meant to have the dry level all the way down and only have wet level all the way up um, when you have these sand tracks they're meant to be 100% wet. You don't want to have any dry signal in them because, um, uh, yeah, like um, the whole point is like that you have it uh, parallel to the dry track. So you have like a, a separate track that itself is um, is the dry track, right? Okay, so let's try it again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Obviously this is too much. Okay, notice that the dry signal and the echo actually sound like in terms of tone and timbre, they sound exactly the same. That's fine, um, but there's actually some things you can do to it to make it sound like the echoes are actually getting out of the way of the dry signal so that you uh, it, it focuses the listener only on the dry signal and the echo itself is like an embellishment on top of it so it's just like this little detail that's on top of it so it's not interfering it's not um, taking the attention away from the singer so here in this part you can see um, we've got number two and number one these are filters that specifically EQ the feedback circuit so if we open this up here in the feedback loop this is going to have a high pass filter and a low pass filter with an eq right so like it's eqing the loop so every time it goes through the delay it's going to be filtered through the eq and then go through again and then filtered through the eq again every single time it goes through it's, it's filtered again and again and again right so um, it gets more extreme the longer the echo. So let's have a listen to what that sounds like. So I'm gonna bring number one back. So I'm just clicking and dragging. You can also drag it up to get a resonant peak. And I'll show you what that sounds like. So I'll just solo the echo. So now we're only hearing the wet. Whoops, sorry. So that's a resonant peak. If you have it too high, um, it, uh, it starts feeding back on itself. It starts making a, a self-oscillated kind of a tone. So let's hear that again with, um, with the vocal, with the dry vocal. Okay. And kings too. Roll the dice, little guy. 
Cool. That sounds pretty good to me, but obviously there's just too much of it once we put it into the mix. Like it's just going to sound like way too echoey. So let's have a listen to it in the mix. Yeah, you can really hear the echo. You basically don't want to hear it. It just, you want it to be like a embellishment. You want to only be able to hear it if you're really listening out for it. So let's take it down all the way, negative infinity. We'll press play and we'll start bringing it in until it's just a little bit too much and then bring it down just a touch. Now we can hear it. Let's turn it down. Okay. Now we have an echo that sounds really nice. Um, you can only hear it when it's um, when you're really listening in for it. Um, and what it's doing is it's actually kind of giving like a, a dimension to the vocal that um, wouldn't otherwise be there. This is something that uh, virtually every song has. Um, there's the vox reverb and vox echo. Even if it doesn't sound like there's you know, anything on it at all, it probably has a, you know, at least a tiny little bit. Um, that's been a thing pretty much since like recorded music, <laughs> um, has been a thing since like tape echoes have existed. Um, that's been a thing. Okay. So that's what I would do with an echo. Um, pretty much just put it on the lead vocal. Uh, has anyone got any questions about that? Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Um, you can send questions. Uh, I'll be intermittently checking um, as we go as well. So, um, cool. Okay, let's move on. Um, oh, yeah, important echo controls, timing, feedback, wet, dry mix. Yep, so we've already gone through that. Okay, um, let's talk about modulation. So, modulation effects are, um, I guess, like, you know, um, it's like, you know, it's a little bit more fancy than like, just like compressing something and EQing something. It's like, oh, wow, that sounds like an effect. You know, it's not just like, um, you know, like you're doing something to make it sound nicer. You're actually affecting it in a way that's going to have a noticeable change to the sound, right? So uh, we talked a little bit about um, uh, modulation in reverbs. Uh, I didn't actually give you an example of that, but yeah, sorry about that, but let's do it here. Um, okay. So one of the most famous kinds of modulations is, uh, a chorus. So a lot of guitarists will use chorus effects on their guitar. Um, it's a very common, uh, kind of an effect basically makes a guitar sound really watery. Like it's warping, like, like waves undulating kind of a thing. Um, another kind is a flanger, which, um, anyone that's listened to like, uh, yeah, like old, like, like the sort of stuff that like, um, yeah, like, like the hippies would have been listening to like in the sixties and seventies or whatever. Um, sometimes there'll be flanger on the drums and it kind of makes the drum sound like an airplane flying overhead. I'm going to give you examples of all this in a minute. Basically, um, yeah, let's, let's give a description of it. It's really hard to describe actually what a modulation effect is without showing it. So let's just try describing it. <laughs> um, but bear with me. If you don't understand it, it's cool. Modulation effects change the sound of the source signal by putting them through an echo circuit with an LFO, which means low frequency oscillator. Don't get scared of that word um, or that, that term. Um, uh, I'll explain it in just a minute. Um, the LFO is connected to the timing parameter of the del delay. So you notice before, we were changing the timing of the delay, but it was staying still. Once we set it, it just stays still. It doesn't change. The LFO actually pushes that parameter forwards and backwards. So if you set it to like, um, if you set a delay, uh, the, the timing of an echo to like, you know, a hundred milliseconds, if you have an LFO attached to it, it might, uh, push it backwards and forwards between like 90 milliseconds and 110 milliseconds, for example. You can obviously get like really extreme um, examples of that as well. Uh, but yeah, like that's just, just to give you an idea, a low frequency oscillator is something that just affects uh, whatever you want it to be attached to. In the case of modulation, it's attached to the timing parameter of an echo circuit. 
and we're using extremely short echoes. So um, I'll show you an example. Again, let's try it on the vocals because it's actually really, um, uh, really easy to hear. Um, where are we going to do it? Let's do it in a different part of the song so we don't get sick of that same bit. Um, cool. Okay, again, I'm going to solo it. I'm going to mute the reverb and delay. I'm going to bring in another instance of Timeless 2. So usually, you know, you use an, like a dedicated modulating modulator um, uh, plugin. Uh, something like Valhalla Ubermod is something that people will use to get their digital modulation. But I want to actually use this just to show you what's happening inside of a modulation circuit. Because um, once you understand what's really going on in there, uh, that's when you'll be able to like, you know, really use it and like understand what you're doing when you're doing it. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is lock both of these. So I'm locking feedback and I'm locking time and I'm bringing feedback down to zero on both of these and I'm bringing time. You can double click it and write in what milliseconds you want. I'm going to write in 20, no, I'm going to write in 30. 30 milliseconds is extremely short. You can see it's like right at the beginning of this parameter. Um, and what I'm going to do is use uh, this lower part of, um, of this plugin. Um, so I'm going to go click this plus button, um, new XLFO. XLFO means it's an LFO that's connected to X. And I'm going to take this. If you click and hold it, it highlights everything like this. Um, don't worry if this is really confusing, by the way. Um, I'm just doing it just to show you. Basically, I'm connecting this LFO to the delay time. You can do this at home if you want to. Um, it's not really necessary. You can use like chorus effects. Reaper has a native one that's called um, uh, JS uh, Chorus or something like that. You can just use chorus. Um, so yeah, this is going to be uh, affecting this. So this is the shape that it's taking. So it's going to be rising up, right, uh, falling down over and over again. It's going to be doing it as fast as we set this parameter, the frequency. So that's going to change the speed of it. And we can see up here with this XLFO, the top part of it is uh, fading in and out. It's going dark gray, then white, and it's fading back and forth. And it's actually showing us how um, fast it's going. So if I go faster, it's going to start like blinking. If I go slower, it's going to blink really slowly. Okay. So I'm going to set it to about here just for the sake of an example. And actually, um, this controls how strong the LFO is going to be affecting this. So this is actually too strong. We need to bring this all the way down to um, 0 0.001 um, for the sake of this example. Again, it's okay if you're not following um, hundred percent, but I'm just showing you that I'm only affecting this a little bit, basically, and it's going to be at this rate. Okay, so let's let's play them both at the exact same level. Let's make them both uh, negative six, so that they're both going to be. It's going to be equal parts wet and dry signal. So the wet signal is now going to be uh, modulating with this LFO, pushing the delay time between. Uh, 25 to 35 milliseconds. So at the lowest point of this graph is going to be 25. At the highest point is going to be 35, approximately, because we've set this to a very small level, 0 0.001. Let's hear it. The Can you hear how it's actually kind of moving in and out? Let's um, start turning up this feedback. Can you hear the higher frequencies kind of like phasing in and out? Um, uh, if you can, please, <laughs> please message. <laughs> I'm starting to get worried that um, people aren't following anymore. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it's kind of like phasing in and out. It's um, 
I'm turning up the feedback so that we have more echoes, even though it's a very short echo. And the more you put this feedback in, the more you're going to hear the chorus um, doing its thing. So let's try that again with even more feedback. And I'll show you what it actually does when you start getting past that, um, that point where it's no longer um, fading out every time it echoes, but it's actually amplifying every time it echoes. It's starting to feed back. Cool. Okay. Let's go back to this. This is a more conservative place. Let's hear what it sounds like if we have more effect, more of the LFO controlling this. So we can go like really crazy with it. Let's show you what happens. Now you're hearing that there's like this massive pitching change. So basically the LFO is changing the timing and the timing actually changes the pitch. Let me just turn this off for a sec. If we mess with this timing, you're, you're changing the timing of the speed of a tape machine, basically. This is modeling a tape echo. So like, if you slow it down while it's playing, it's gonna sound like you've slowed the tape down. But then once it stays still, then it goes back into pitch. Right, so once it's still, it's keeping its pitch, but when it's moving, it's changing the pitch. If you shorten the delay time, it's gonna go up in pitch. If you lengthen the delay, the delay time, it's gonna go down in pitch. Um, so that's why when you have an LFO connecting to it that's turning it up and down like this, it's going to change the pitch. And so we had it set to 30 milliseconds. We had this at 0 0.001 and turned on. So that's why we've got a little bit, right? Um, so it's only changing it a tiny, tiny amount. And that's what's giving it that really lush kind of uh, effect that we had a moment ago. So let's hear that again. So this is back to normal, back to what we had before, I mean. Great. Cool. So we can actually um, unlock this bring this to a different setting, let's say 35, and then connect the LFO to that as well. So now it's connected to two of these and it's affecting them the exact same way, but the times are different. So now we have a stereo chorus. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to change the amounts that this is being affected. So delay two is now being affected way too much. 0 0.001, enter. Okay, so now they're going to be affected the same amount, but the timing is going to be different. So let's try that again. <laughs> the Killer. Sounds really good. We can turn these feedbacks up as well. So it sounds really lively. It sounds really beautiful to me. Um, so often I actually use a little bit of this on a vocal as well. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions about that at all? Um, I hear it. Yes. Crazy. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you for letting me know. Uh, yeah, please, um, you know, uh, message any questions as we're going through as well. Um, maybe actually, uh, in a minute, we might actually just go to only chatting once I finish the modulation section. Maybe we'll just go to only chatting for like a few minutes and any questions that you've had, you can just like start sending them through to me. And yeah, that way, um, that way I can just instantly respond via chat instead of, um, instead of talking on this. Cause like, I think the video has got too much latency for it to be uh, comfortable back and forth. Ah, oh, the things we do for coronavirus. Okay. Um, what are we doing next? Uh, yeah, so the one that we just did was actually called Chorus, okay? Um, so there's another kind of uh, modulation plugin, which is called a flanger. A flanger is, uh, it's basically like, you know, like if you're walking in the, um, like Amsterdam bus or something, you know, and the airplanes are flying overhead. Um, you hear like when it's far away, 
it sounds like um it sounds different to when it flies overhead like when it's flying overhead it almost sounds like the the pitch is dropping but it's kind of morphing in and out as it's doing that um that's a flanging effect basically what's happening is the sound is coming from the airplane it's traveling through the air it's hitting the ground and then it's bouncing back up into your ears and so you're actually hearing the direct sound from the airplane as the sound of the airplane hits your ears but then you're also getting that first echo from the the ground that's echoing back into your ears and the closer the airplane is to you the shorter that echo time is because um it it's a more direct um a more direct sound right uh, i don't know if that makes it, that made sense but um basically you're hearing this exact thing that we're talking about but it's much quicker than what we just did. Chorus sounds really musical and really lush. Flanger is much shorter. It's a much quicker kind of a um, it's much quicker kind of a modulation effect. So, uh, typically sp speaking, a chorus's delay time will be set to twenty to thirty milliseconds, um, sometimes more than thirty milliseconds, um, and a flanger is much shorter. Sometimes it's ten, sometimes it's up to twenty. But yeah, sometimes it can even be shorter than that, like five milliseconds. These are just like rough, you know, approximations. Um, the thing that makes different flanges sound different to one another is actually just these variables, you know. Um, so let's have a listen to that. We're actually going to try it on a different instrument. Let's try it on a drum kit because this is. <laughs> Um, I don't know, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but this is like what you would have heard in like a bunch of like those trippy um, hippie tracks from like the 60s and stuff like that, like when they're trying to make you like fully trip out, bro. Um, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, first, let's um, lock all of these, bring the feedback all the way down. So I've just loaded it up onto this drum bus number four so this is all of our drums are going into number four um and i'm going to double click delay time left because i've locked these two parameters and i'm going to say 10 milliseconds okay so we've got no feedback we've got 10 milliseconds here but that's just static so we're going to add an lfo new x lfo we're going to connect it to the timing we're going to set this to 0 0.001 so it's only affecting it a little bit um, and we're going to slow this right down. So the XLFO frequency is going to be quite, quite slow. Let's hear it. All right, we have to open this up. So I'm turning up this um, level actually to 0 0.005 to give you a more... Now you're hearing it a lot, right? So this is with no feedback. So you're only hearing that one that's being moved around. Let's try even lower. Let's try five milliseconds. Yeah. So it's, it's a much more extreme sounding effect, flanger. Um, I probably wouldn't use it in this track. It doesn't sound that, that good. But just to give you an idea of what it is, um, there is one other kind of modulation effect. It's called phaser, um, but that uses delay as well as something called an all-pass filter, which is it's too complicated to um, go into. And to be honest, I don't actually understand <laughs> all-pass filters that well. I've got like you know, maybe out of all of the nerdy sound geek friends that I've had over the years, I think I know of one other 
um, one other uh, sound nerd that actually knows what an all-pass filter is. I only vaguely understand how it works. Um, but yeah, let's not go into that anyway because we can't um, mimic that with with Timeless 2. Um, so yeah, uh, why don't we go into... Um, why don't we go into uh, some, yeah, some chat. Does anyone have, if anyone has questions, please just like message the chat and I will respond in the chat itself. Um, and that way we can sort of like, you know, people that need to take a break can go and take a break. People that don't, you can come in and, you know, we'll do, we'll do it. Cool. So I'll message the chat now and I'll just respond on there. We're doing really good for time as well. Okay, while someone uh, messages, I'm actually gonna go get myself um, uh, uh, water. Hmm, dry guitar signal. Okay, I'll answer this first. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm actually going to uh, just show you real quick what I've actually done to the guitars. So, because um, the guitars don't really have much, it's like once you um, once you get the balance right, it's it's just kind of there. Um, so, the main distorted guitars, it's pretty hard to get them wrong. Like if you put the microphone in the right place, basically, like if you're if you're micing up a guitar amp, um, let's actually find a. Um, Guitar speaker, twelve inch. Okay, um, let's find a image of one. Um, uh, okay, here, here's a good one. All right, so here, um, here's like a twelve inch guitar speaker for a guitar amp, right? Like most of the guitar signal is going to be like most of the guitar sound in a recording is what guitar you're using, what pedals you're using, what amp you're using, what microphone you're using. Once you've got all of those sorted out, once, once you can get like a really good sound, like exactly what you want from that guitar, all you have to do is put the microphone in the right place and it's going to be more or less right. Like you don't really have to do much. And the best place to put it is this middle part here, that's called the dust cap. This part on the outside is called the speaker cone. Um, where the dust cap meets the speaker cone, that glue right there, that's where you put the microphone. Um, that's going to give you the most balanced sound of high frequencies and low, low frequencies. Um, and pretty, I, I put it pretty close as well. Um, I usually have like, uh, you know, um, I usually have the <laughs> microphone like almost touching the grill, like maybe like two or three centimeters away from touching the grill of the um, of the uh, speaker cabinet. This this one obviously doesn't have a grill. Um, this is just, you know, but yeah, like, I mean, like I've, I've known people to put it like right up against it, but I don't do it like, you know, I didn't take the grill off and put it right up against it. But like, if there's a grill, I just put it like a few centimeters away from it because it gives it enough space for the sound to develop before it has, hits the microphone. Um, and if you have it just where the dust cap meets the speaker cone, it's really nicely balanced. And then all you have to do is press record, basically. Um, but then, yeah, like there are some issues that can rise from that. Um, 
Like uh, this one doesn't actually have that issue so much, but I'll just solo the guitar and show you. Um... Wait, let's go to the... This is what I've done to it, right? So I'll just show you like enlarged. Um, actually these two I haven't um, enabled because it didn't need that. Um, it just, it had too much of this low frequency. So let's disable all of these. This is with no compression, I mean, no, no equalization. Let's turn this on. So it's, it's just really minor. It's just taking out a little bit of that boxiness, but it's keeping the, the fundamental um, frequency intact. So this lowest frequency is still strong, but I'm taking out like the um, the other frequencies that are close to the low one, like the um, the second, third, and fourth harmonics in the harmonic sequence. I'm just turning those down a little bit, and then I just turn this up a little bit. If we listen to it, this is like that. Um, that's like where like that kind of like vocal kind of sound of a guitar is. It sounds a bit throaty and a little bit like, you know, aggressive. So I like that. This is like the presence. So let's hear that. You're hearing like it's, um, it's kind of like where the pick hits the, hits the strings. That's where that sound is. I just wanted the guitar to be a little bit more articulate. So I've turned that up because um, yes, yeah, sometimes it's just not bright enough. And this is like the airy kind of presence. It sounds really harsh by itself. It just sounds like a broken toy or something. <laughs> um, but if you turn it on, it sounds really good with the rest. Yeah. And you also asked about compression. Um, actually, uh, if you if you think about what the what the point of compression is, it's to um, it's to diminish the dynamic range of an instrument, right? So, for example, a drum a drum kit has a huge dynamic range. We'll look at a um, kick drum here. This is what we did uh, last week. Um, this kick drum, right? If we have a look at this. You can see there's a huge peak at the beginning. As soon as the kick hits, it goes, it spikes up a lot. And then you've got all the low fre lower frequency here. That's, you can see all the fundamental and, um, you know, like this, uh, it basically looks like a sine wave. That's like, you know, um, that's what it, it kind of is, right? Um, that's all the lower frequencies. It's got a huge dynamic range. If you compress it, you can turn up the volume of this part, the sustain, while diminishing this initial click and it's gonna sound a lot more punchy. Um, the thing about compression is actually, um, this is something I should have talked about last week, but I'll, I'll talk about it now. Compression is, um, is extremely important also because it sounds really natural to us. And the reason being is uh, we have a biological um, uh, reflex, you know, like it's, it's kind of like a defense mechanism against uh, high, sound pressure level you know so like if you like have like um i don't know like a tree falling down it's gonna like sound extremely loud to us and it could damage your inner ear so what actually happens is you have a reflex inside of your inner ear where some muscles inside your ear are going to contract and protect itself from the volume of that sound right so that's actually something called the acoustic reflex. So um, it's actually engaging when you're talking. It's engaging in my ears right now as I'm monitoring myself talking. Um, and it's compressing the sound effectively. Every time it's, it's passing a certain threshold, according to my ears, it's turning it down to a certain degree. And then when it's uh, uh, lower than that threshold, it's, it's turning it back up again. So um, you're your hearing compression. So if you hear a drum kit in the real world, your ears are going to be compressing it like crazy. So when you hear a drum kit, you're hearing compression. But when you put a microphone in front of a drum kit, that microphone is designed to be extremely linear in the way that it captures and reproduces that sound. So it's not going to compress. 
that's uh, obviously you're trying to make them sound as nice as possible, but that's why it sounds a little bit unnatural for us to hear just a dry kick drum. And that's why a lot of the time we also want to hear some compression on a drum kit because it actually sounds like a real thing. Having said that, going on to guitars, this is what a guitar looks like. Notice that there's almost no dynamics here, right? Um, it's pretty much just like a cheese block of sound. <laughs> The, that's because uh, distortion itself is a dynamic processor. It's a dynamics processor. It's turning down the dynamic range of the guitar. Um, so basically, you don't really need to compress it if it's already been distorted. That's you know the way I kind of look at it. Um, you can uh, do that sometimes, like you know, if you have like a lot of distortion and you have a, a guitarist who's doing palm mutes the bass frequencies when they're palm muting suddenly jump out and they're really, really loud compared to when they're just playing an open chord because the open chord is being captured by the distortion and distor uh, and it's being compressed by the distortion itself. But suddenly the, um, the lower frequencies are jumping out as soon as they do a palm mute. In that case, I would put a limiter, like a really heavy compressor that only is engaging when it's palm muting. So I would set the threshold intelligently. I would find that point where like when they're just playing open chords, it's nothing. But when they play a palm mute and it jumps up, the threshold should be right there so that it's diminishing the um, volume of those uh, those palm mutes. You know, that's, in, that's if you want it to sound tighter. But um, yeah, I usually don't compress electric guitars, distorted ones at least. Sometimes I compress, I mean, quite often I compress clean electric guitars. So actually I can give you an example of that. Um, look at this one. So this is the beginning of the um, of the song. I'm just gonna solo it and um, show you what I did to it. So this will be looping. So cool. So it's this one. So you can hear um, it's quite compressed. If I turn it off If I turn this off. So this is without any compression and without any EQ. You can hear how it sounds quite honky. It sounds really hollow. So that's why, see this one here? I've turned that down quite a bit because like, this one, that's the frequency, <laughs> well like the frequency range. Turn that off. Sounds really ugly. So I've done this just to get a little bit more brightness out of it to make it sound a little bit more jangly because I think that's what they were going for. Um, and I've got this compressor. Every time it does something loud, it's turning it down, especially that last one. You hear that? So that's that's really just um, it's just taking away the the attack. Um, so it's not um, it's not messing with the sustain, and it sounds very transparent. I'm not um, I'm not doing anything to make it sound affected. I'm making it uh, I'm just controlling it a little bit because um, it just it's more it's easier on the ears because like your ears are going to be compressing it themselves. May as well have a machine do it for you. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, Yeah, cool. Um, I still see the video, by the way. Cool. Um, but you can also use too much compression, right? And take away the dynamics of a miss. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to just message that.
Yeah, a lot of compression is actually down to taste. Um, I mentioned before the um, the acoustic reflex. Um, uh, yeah, like the acoustic reflex in your ears. Um, if you have a very loud sound, like for example an explosion, um, that high sound pressure level actually gets faster. Um, like if you think about your ear, like the acoustic reflex as a compressor, you have faster attack and slower release for louder sounds. So a quieter sound will still be compressing a little bit, um, but it will be a slower attack, faster release. Um, and yeah, eventually like, you know, uh, if you have a sound that's loud enough, your ears will completely cut out for a split second after the initial impact and then come back in as well. Cause it'll just like clamp down so hard. Um, that's why when you watch a movie and they have an explosion to make it seem believable, instead of just having like a, poof, it's like, poof, right. It's got that initial, like, you know, attack and then the ears cut out completely. And then the rest comes in that gives it like, it makes it sound more impactful. Um, but in the real world, actually, the explosion is just a continuous um, uh, sound. Okay. Um, any other questions? <laughs> it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of weird, like, interfacing through, like, two different digital mediums at the same time. <laughs> it's like, I'm like talking to my, I feel like, yeah, it's so weird. Like talking to people like mediated through my computer while the whole country's in like this, like self quarantine. <laughs> okay. If you double track the guitar, a clean sound with reverb, do you record both channels with reverb or one with dry, one with effects? Oh, good question. Okay, um, uh, what am I going to say? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, um, so yeah, so uh, some people do that. So some people do record um, some of the, um, like uh, they'll record like an affected guitar on the left and a dry guitar on the right. I personally am not one of those people. I don't know why I like symmetry in a mix. Um, when it comes to like, you know, like, conventional kinds of music. I mean, like I am a, personally, I'm a noise musician. Like I make noise music and like, you know, there's often not much symmetry in what I do and that's on purpose. But like when I'm listening to like more conventional styles of music, I want to hear it balanced. I want to hear things like really, because like, I don't know, like for me, it's like, um, like I want to hear personalities um, presented to me in a way that doesn't confuse me. And the way that my brain works is like, if there's too many things going on, it confuses me. And uh, yeah, like if there's effects on one side and no effects on the other side, that's one of those ways in which it's, um, yeah, it just kind of throws me off a little bit. And I am not as interested in it personally, um, but I know that there's actually um, a lot of uh, producers and engineers that do the asymmetrical thing of like having like some, uh, you know, like they'll have like effects on one side and like dry on the other side. So usually what I do with guitars is I will have, um, you know, uh, depending on the style of music, I would like to know what style you're, you know, specifically talking about. Cause like, I can give you more like uh, directed advice, but like, for example, like if I was, um, the producer of this band, this band specifically, um, I would have, um, I would have asked them to, uh, uh, first of all, like show me their guitar parts and we would go in and actually try to find the right 
uh, guitar for it because I think that this guitar is quite nice, um, but it's not the best, you know, for what they, I think for what they, they were trying to go for. So, um, like I would have probably gotten, um, uh, something a little bit nicer, you know, uh, from you know like rented from a shop or something like that um and the amplifier i think is set in a it's it's too conservative for what they're trying to do like i think because like they're sounding like they want to be like tool for example um the guitar amps for a band like tool are just like absolutely dimed like they're just you know like the the power amp like the master level of that amplifier is gone to like 10 possibly you know um which is like obscenely loud on a 100 watt amplifier and um i think maybe this band uh might not have had the resources or might not have had the right producer for them because like i think you know um this is a good song and like i can hear what they're doing you know what they're trying to do um but yeah like the first thing i would have done is like get those elements in check and then i would have had the right microphones in place so i would have two microphones close up and I also would have actually had a room microphone for the guitar and I would have been working with them to get the right um, effects and having the effects controlled in a way that, you know, I know is going to translate really well in a recorded environment. So like, you know, not live, you know, because like for them, like, you know, they're playing in their rehearsal room, they're hearing it as they're hearing things loudly and their ears are changing the sound to them. But like, once you put a microphone and like start processing it, it's going to sound completely different to that. So I'd be like hearing what they're hearing, you know, in the rehearsal room and then doing the things that are necessary for um, that to translate as effectively as possible, which isn't necessarily the way that they've set things up. So, um, so that's the next thing I would do. Um, and then I would probably listen to, um, what the most important guitar parts are and if there needs to be something else that is uh, added to it to embellish those parts often doesn't need to be much but um, maybe like a lead um, background kind of like a guitar that just does something else you know um, and that's something I would use to like make it sound a little bit more exciting um, and then I would just change the balance of the microphones. So like usually like if it's a double tracked guitar, I'll just have it completely the same on both sides. Um, and like, uh, and for different parts of the song, I might like change that. So if there's, for example, like a more clean guitar part coming in, I would actually bring up the room guitar sound to, um, to make the, the, like give it a natural reverb instead of like using the artificial reverb, for example, um, that's my personal way of doing things. Um, if there's a guitar solo, um, I would get them to have the right uh, effect on it, like as much as possible in the first place. And then if there needs to be an echo, that's when I would actually get them to record it uh, live without an echo. And then I would put an echo in, you know, after the fact. And actually a lot of a lot of guitar um, recordings end up happening that way because once you've recorded it, you can't take the echo off, um, but you can um, uh, like reamp through an echo unit after you've recorded it. So, um, so yeah, I might put it through like a really nice echo or um, just through an echo plugin or something like that, and then like affect that plugin in a way I want. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, so yeah, like to answer you, yeah, like more directly. What you're saying is completely fine. Like a lot of people do it. And I'm actually one of the rare people that doesn't do that so much. You know, I like to do the old, you know, um, the old rock and roll kind of uh, double track kind of stuff. You know, um, it's just the way that I've done things. But if it's a more experimental genre, then definitely I would. But this is this is pretty conventional. You know, um, this is definitely like tracing a lineage back to like the, um, you know, like that real like you know, double tracked, like, you know, even sort of thing. But yeah, like, I don't know if it's like, you know, shoegaze or something like that, or like if it's more of an experimental genre, then that's when I would probably do a bunch of different things, but making sure that like the, the frequencies are balanced more or less left to right. So it's not feeling like it's lopsided in the mix or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I waffled a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I like rambled so much just now. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on. Apologies. All right. So important modulation controls. Okay. 
All right. Um, saturation. So we're going to go into saturation now. Uh, so saturation is distortion. So now we've done reverb, we've done delay, we've done modulation. We're going into distortion, saturation, distortion. Um, saturation is a kind of effect that creates distortion. Usually saturation effects model the sound of vacuum tube circuits and tape machines that were common in the 1920s to 1980s era recordings. So pretty much all of the, like pretty much since the beginning of recording till, um, till the 1980s when the transition into uh, digital was first starting to happen. Um, vacuum tubes were used um, and they actually created distortion. And um, the struggle for engineers was to create a vacuum tube circuit that didn't have distortion. So it was actually the cleanest way that they could produce sounds, right? Um, but, you know, it was an imperfect way of um, amplifying a signal. So um, that's why it sounds the way it does. Um, yeah, and also tapes as well. Um, tape machines, uh, that was how we used to record things before digital became a thing as well. So um, there were actual reel-to-reel -reel tape machines. Um, and uh, tape is basically like a magnetic particle put onto a piece of um, plastic, right? And like um, those magnetic particles are magnetized to uh, draw in the direction of the waveform. And they're pretty good but like it's not a perfect representation and because it's not a perfect rep representation it's distorted right so like um imperfection is what saturation is distortion is imperfection um the more gain you apply the more distortion you get so gain is basically like um volume right so how much volume you're putting into the distortion unit is the amount of gain that you're putting in um the more it distorts, the more extra harmonics you get. I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, too much distortion can give harsh results, but this can be filtered out if need be with a bit of EQ after the distortion plugin. This is something that people do a lot. So, um, and actually something that people don't talk about as much um, as it's, it's often done. Um, but yeah, like filtering after distortion is very important because like when you're adding a bunch of harmonics, it can be too much. So you need to um, go back and EQ. And also you'll get a lot of like low frequency harmonics as well, um, sub harmonics. So that's when you, um, that's when you need to uh, put like filter it out as well. So it doesn't like, you know, go into territory that you don't want it to go. Uh, saturation distortion is basically a broken circuit that doesn't let the volume of the signal pass an artificially lowered ceiling. So what do I mean by that? If we, um, if we had all of these uh, faders on all of these tracks too high, this part here, the meter on the master track... Oops, shit, I forgot that I'd soloed this. This meter would be clipping like that. Notice how it went red. That's telling us that it's actually hitting the ceiling. That's the maximum of what this uh, program is capable of reproducing. Um, so once it hits that maximum, it can't reproduce anything more than that. So it's actually clipping the top of that signal off, just like a distortion on a guitar is clipping the top of the picking off. Um, so yeah, that's distortion. That's a digital distortion. So saturation is the exact same thing. So like um, it's modeling different uh, forms of broken circuits that have an artificially lowered ceiling. So this is a digital ceiling, um, which is set at uh, zero decibels, um, full scale. That's like the, that's the name of the um, meter that we use, like decibels full scale. And um, everything lower than that is like negative decibels. That's like how it's, um, that's how it is working in digital. Um, in a saturator, it's just like, you know, you're just turning it up into a ceiling and it's just like, it's pushing it up further and further and it's just getting more and more squished and more and more distorted. So I'm gonna show you actually um, how to distort stuff, what it sounds like on a drum kit so you can hear it. And then I'm gonna show you a really cool trick on a bass guitar to make this bass guitar sound better. So let's have a listen to this drums. Yeah. I'm gonna load in Saturn. So Saturn is um, this is the distortion plugin. Okay, now we're hearing the distortion on the drums. 
you hear the kick drum is completely blown out and like the snare drum sounds really messy it's pretty cool i love it but um it's like obviously not what this is needing um a little bit of saturation actually goes a long way so this is like with none um This is actually applying a little bit of distortion, but you're not hearing it so much, but it just sounds warmer. So something that I like to do. Sounds really good on guitar as well. Let's just put it on because fuck it. Why not distort everything, right? <laughs> but like not too much, you know, like you just don't, you don't want to take it too far. Like if you take it here, it's like getting a bit gnarly. But if you just have like a little bit, Just make it sound a little bit warmer, but then you also have to filter it. So I'm just gonna get rid of all these low frequencies. Do you notice all this here? If I turn off the saturator, it doesn't have all these low frequencies anymore. But now, like you've got all this like um, low frequency stuff going on, so we want to get rid of that again. Cool. Oh yeah, I forgot that we put that there. Let's hear it. Okay, cool. Um, so let's hear what it's gonna sound like on a bass guitar. So I'm gonna solo the bass bus here. I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna take this. So here I've actually added a duplicate of this bass DI here. Notice I actually haven't put any, um, any effects on any of this. Right? That's because the bass actually sounded really nice and all we had to do was um, just kind of like get the balance right between all of these things. And once we got the balance right, it was good. But here, I'm actually going to... Um, this is a duplicate. This one is the same as this. Exactly the same um, track. Uh, but I'm going to crunch it up. I'm going to um, solo this and actually filter it and distort it. So the first thing I'm going to do is put in some EQ. Let's have a listen to it. I don't want to distort all of it. I want to take out the high frequencies so it doesn't distort the high frequencies so much. I'm going to take out the lowest parts. I'm only going to uh, distort this low mid-range. This is going to make it sound like really um, crunchy as well. I'm also just going to compress it before the saturator because that makes the saturation a lot more um, uh, consistent. So this is being compressed like a lot um, and that's okay because we're doing this for a specific effect. So now we're going to load up some saturator and we're going to see just going through different cool I like this one now we can get this we can highlight these two and use this find the right place. Um, so now that we've actually processed this quite a lot, the problem is that this is going to have phasing issues with the race, rest of the bass. So let's have a listen to the rest of the bass and start bringing this in and see what happens to the low frequencies. Let me just turn this bass up. Now I'm going to start bringing in this crunchy channel. Listen to the low frequencies and how it all changes. Okay, it sounds like it's fitting really well, but watch what happens when we click this phase inverter. This is normal, this is flipped. Notice how like the sub frequencies are suddenly extremely like strong. That's because once we put all this processing on it, um, this is going to be phasing out with other stuff. So once you put a lot of processing on one track that's a duplicate of something else, always try flipping the phase and seeing what happens to the, um, to the lower frequencies especially. Because um, there's always going to be something that needs to be um, uh, tweaked, 
right? So now let's try to bring it into the mix. And um, actually, wait, let's just try to try to find the right level of this first. So we're just putting a little bit in. It's just to get it a bit more growly. Cool. Now listen without it. It's like, where did the bass guitar go, you know? Now that's in. Yeah, so that's that's something like, uh, that I quite often do. Um, just take the bass guitar and like put a little bit of uh, distortion on it if it hasn't already been distorted often if I'm the actual producer I'll have two bass amps like I'll have the bass guitar splitting into two different bass amps and one will be distorted and one will be, one will be clean and then I can mix between those two and like find the right um, find the right balance between the two um, but because this band hadn't done that I have gone in and done that uh, in digital which is cool um, is there any questions about that stuff <laughs> I usually do rock metal and of course I would love to sound like Tool. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, um yeah, uh we can talk about <laughs> we can talk about how Tool get their sound um a little bit later if you like. Um cool. Uh so uh it's pretty much it. Um yeah. Uh I I think that's pretty much saturation done. I mean, have I missed anything? Yeah, it's saturation is just gain and volume. You know, gain is like how much you're putting into it, you know, which is basically a distortion control. And output volume is how much you're bringing it back, back down to control it. Um, famous saturation types, there's tube saturation, there's tape saturation, and then there's digital clipping, which we've already spoken about. Okay. Let's go into this telephone effect. I'm really excited to talk to you about this because um, this is something I think that uh, a lot of people use and there are some tutorials on it, but I think that uh, I think that I could probably do it in a little bit more of a clearer way. So telephones um, basically, okay, let's do it on this. I'm gonna just mute uh, these two. Actually, wait. Let's go to the bridge because I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put it in this uh, in this breakdown. Okay, we're gonna do it here, and I'm going to actually right click here and go duplicate track. So now we've got two of the exact same track. Um, they're both going to the same place, except what I'm gonna actually do is click here. This track is highlighted and I'm going to press S. S splits these two parts. Now I can delete the first part and let's see how far we want to go. Open up this okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this entire section. And here I'm going to actually delete it from this, um, from this track. So now we're only going to have a telephone effect on uh, track eight and it's going to be going through this entire time here and eventually you know after this first part here the um, the cleaner uh, vocals are going to be coming in and joining it together and then the next part is also going to going to be together and then it's going to be back to normal so this is going to be our um, our telephone so I'm going to rename it telephone Vox. Um, always good to abbreviate because, yeah, then you can see it. Um, solo. Uh, what am I going to do? Let's get rid of all of this. Okay, now we've got this completely dry. And I'm also actually going to... If you shift-click these, it mutes it. These are the sends. I'm just muting them so that we only hear the dry signal. Cool. All right, so let's um, load in, first of all, uh, an EQ. And with telephones, actually what we do is we filter it with a high pass filter at around 300 Hertz. 
and then a low pass filter at around 3000 hertz, right? Um, it already sounds pretty pretty telephony. You can you can mess around with this and just like, you know, see what's sounding good to you. It's also good to put a little bit of a, a resonant peak here, so it just sounds a little bit nasally. Right? So if we undo this, sounds like that. Now it sounds like this. So that's the first step. So that's the first thing the telephones do. The microphone inside of a telephone is very small and it doesn't have a full bandwidth. Um, it, it can only lim uh, pick up a limited uh, bandwidth. So that's why it sounds like that. But the next thing it does is ac actually it, um, it compresses the crap out of it. Pretty much a hard knee, um, infinity to, to one ratio, which means it's limiting. And then we're gonna turn the threshold down until it's just like obliterated. Yeah, and I've just got a slightly slower attack than I had at the start. That way all of the, like, you know, the D in dust and K in came is like more, it's like popping through the compressor a little bit more. So it's sounding a little bit more articulate. That's something that's like really common in, um, in telephone compressors as well. And then we saturate it a lot. But notice what's gonna happen with the saturator. Have a listen. I'm gonna use a broken tube. Right? Now it doesn't sound like a telephone anymore. It sounded more like a telephone before, but we have more harmonics. So let me show you uh, with the Pro Q3 what the harmonic difference is when we turn satin on and off. So I'm gonna turn this off. That's what it looks like. And now we put satin on, you can see all this high frequency stuff going on. So that's why we have to actually go in and do this again. Cool. So we've actually taken away all of the higher frequencies that have been introduced by Saturn by this extreme um, distortion setting that we put in. and then uh, it sounds much more like a telephone. So if we don't do that, um, it did sound like a telephone before we put the saturator and the second filter in there. Like, have a listen to this. Sounds pretty telephony, but then once you put these in, it's probably a little bit too much distortion. It sounds pretty good, right? Okay, I'm gonna unmute these and we can have a different, um, different setting for the echo and the core, uh, echo and the reverb. So let's have a listen to it. Now it's mixing with the original. It sounds really nice. Cool, let's go here. Right. So now you've got that telephone distorted effect blended in in parallel to the dry um on it's not really dry you've got a bunch of you know effects on the other one but it's it's drier than the affected telephone signal so you've got the blend of the two which sounds really cool so that's how you do that um how's that sound to everyone the phase flipping yes yeah cool yeah um the the phase stuff is like oh my god it's it's a huge pain in the ass because like um uh, yeah, it's it's always an issue and actually it's very difficult for people to understand it as well. I think it took me quite a long time before I really got my head around phase. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you were, you were one of the um, attendants of the last uh, workshop 
um, but we talked briefly about phase. It's, yeah, just my advice is always try flipping in and out um, when you have, you know, the suspicion that there might be a phasing issue and see what happens. Um, because we're doing like a heavy uh, effect here as well, you know, it's it's going to have phase issues like, you know, like between these two. But I, I'm not so worried about that because I am actually going for a crazy effect. But with the bass guitar, like I do not want to compromise the lower frequencies. So that's why I'm going in and like flipping the phase and checking what's the best amount, you know, what's what's the best setting for the most amount of, you know, bass frequency content. Okay. Um, now we basically have a full mix, right? We've done our, you know, so just to recap, at the beginning of the first session, we started by doing the mix preparation. So putting all of the tracks into, um, into the right place in the session for it to be really um, simple for us to go through and like, you know, know where everything is. So it's really well organized. We're not going to be like going from this creative mixing mentality to um, suddenly like having to, uh, you know, find like where the hell is that Tom coming from, that really weird sounding Tom or whatever. Um, and then we color coded them as well. So that makes it easier to identify where it is. Um, then we started setting up the folder tracks and the group tracks, the group bus tracks. And um, that's when we had finished our mix preparation. We did the rough mixing where we did all the panning, uh, making sure that everything is spaced out in the um, stereo field. And we did all the rough levels of everything. Actually, we did levels first and then we did the panning, if you remember, um, because that way it's uh, easier to translate to a mono speaker system you're more likely to have things mono compatible if you do your rough mixes doing levels first and then doing your panning um, and then doing the final level adjustments after you've done your panning because then you're yeah it's more likely to be mono compatible um, and then yeah like we did our eq we did our compression We've done our uh, reverbs and we've done our delays. We've done our echoes. We've done our modulation. We've done our telephone effects to embellish that part. Um, now the only thing that's left to do is automation. Um, actually, before I talk about automation, there's something that I have completely neglected to tell you about, which is mix bus processing. Um, I don't do too much of it. Uh, mix bus processing is basically this master track here, um, what you do on the effects of that track. Virtually every producer will put a compressor on there. And I've just put up Pro C2. I've chosen the bus style compression because it's actually designed for this kind of work. You want to basically use something that's designed for this because the mix bus has a very harmonically complex material going into it. And because it's so harmonically complex, um, uh, like some compressors are just going to be not like equipped to handle that. Like they're going to really kind of flip out and like do some really weird, not very transparent kind of compression, which is cool. You know, you can like use that for an effect and stuff. But um, for this, you know, they're obviously going for a quite a clean sound, I think. Like, you know, they want that really clean, punchy um you know, natural kind of a sound. So I'm using a bus style compressor. I'm using a 1.62 to one ratio, which is a very, very light ratio. So um, basically it's not even halving the volume past the threshold. It's um, dividing it by 1.62. Um, I've got a very slow attack, 102 milliseconds, so that all of the attacks of the drums are going to be passing through the compressor before the compressor hits. And then I've got a very fast release, 54 milliseconds. So it's immediately jumping back up, but it's not so fast that it's going to distort the bass frequencies in all of this content, okay? And yeah, I've only got as much threshold as I need to compress about like one or two decibels. You see here, it's only like one, 1 1.6, whatever. Um, so it's, it's barely doing anything, but, um, yeah, like that's basically where I would do that. Um, some people do some like mix plus EQing. <clears throat> My mentality is leave that for the mastering engineer. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting coronavirus apparently. Um, so yeah, leave, leave that to the mastering engineer because like, you know, 
as far as I'm concerned, I'm, if I'm the mixing engineer for this project, I've already mixed and EQ'd everything to sound exactly the way that I want it to. Um, and if the mastering engineer notices something that I haven't noticed, then they can come in and, you know, do that change. But I'm, you know, if I need to e equalize something, I'm going to do it at the source with the actual track that needs that to happen. Um, yeah, cool. So let's go on to automation. So what is automation? Um, let's see if there's any questions. Yes, you were there last week. That's great. Okay. Um, automation. Automation is something we can use to change the volumes, panning, or effect parameters of any track at any point in the song so that we don't have to manually change it as the song plays through. So what do I mean by that? Say, for example, um, I want the chorus to be louder than it is. Like the verses sound really good, but then once the chorus hits, it's just sounding flat. It's not energetic enough. Um, you can automate it so that the volume actually jumps up only in the choruses of the song. You can also automate effect parameters. So say, for example, you have like, uh, um, like a really affected echo send on a vocal, right? And the singer is doing some long scream or something like that. Um, you can have a send that's like for the entirety of the song set to negative infinity, so it's off. And then for when that scream comes in, it is automated to come up as that scream is happening so that it's starting to get that echo only in the scream. And then it comes back down again so that it's no longer sending to it after the scream. So those are just some examples of what you can do. You can affect literally any parameter on any plugin. It's you know, Reaper is especially good at this sort of stuff. You can even modulate it with LFOs connected to every any single parameter of any single plugin, you know. Um, so um, obviously there's a lot you can do, a lot of options. Uh, but yeah, we're going to uh, just do volume automation today, I think. Um, so let's go control M to go into our mixing view. Uh, sorry, our... Um, what do you call it? Arrangement view. And if you scroll up to the top, you notice there's no master. You know, back here at the very beginning, you've got your master track. But here you don't. So we need to fix that because we actually, when we're automating something to um, be louder in the chorus, I want the whole mix to be louder in the chorus. I don't want just like, you know, just the vocals or just the guitars or whatever. I want everything to go up. So I'm going to do that instead of individually on every single track, like go in and like draw in the automation lines. I'm going to do it on the master track. So here you go, view, master track, control, alt, M. You can do that. And now we have a master track in your arrangement view. And now if we press play, we can see the fade. I mean, we can see the meters as well. So that's really good. And now here, um, on the top, you can see it's master, you've got your routing, you've got your effects, which are all the, um, all the mastering effects. Don't worry about restream, that's just my, um, that's for the stream that I'm doing, so that's not something you need to do. Um, trim is our, is the thing that we need to open up for automation. So this looks very scary, um, because there's a lot of things, um, that you can automate. You can see we've only got two plugins on this. We've literally just got a Pro Q3 and a Pro C2. And look at all of these options of things that we are able to automate. Every single one of these things is something that you can automate. Um, so all of that was just for Pro C3. I mean, Pro Q3. This is from Pro C2 onwards. These, this is all the stuff that you can automate in just Pro C2, right? But we're not going to do any of those. We're only going to do um the volume and specifically we're going to do the pre-affected volume because i don't want to turn up the processed signal i want to turn up the signal as it's going into the processing so if we click this one here volume pre-effects it's going to put an x here here and here so it's gonna click all three boxes that's what we want so you just click on that it's gonna um, click all three boxes at once. That's a really good thing. And now here we can see the automation line. So we can, so at the moment it's set to zero decibels. We can turn it down, we can turn it up, or we can um, press control Z and bring it back to zero. Um, I'm gonna go back to the first chorus. I'm using my scroll wheel to zoom in, right? So if I press play, 
This is really important when you're automating something to be louder for a part. We want to keep the start of the drum hit intact. And actually I've put this marker in uh, exactly uh, where that kick drum hits. So let's look at it. So C is right before that kick drum. So that if we automate something to be exactly on that line, that kick drum is gonna be intact. It's not going to be turning up in some weird place like here, you know, after the attack or something like that. And we're gonna lose, you know, all of the attack of the drum. So we're just gonna click this marker because I've already done that to all of these markers. I've made sure they're in the right place. Um, we're zoomed in enough. You hold shift and it turns your cursor into this upward arrow. And when you're doing that, you can hold shift and click. And now you see there's a dot. So we've created one dot, but if we turn that up, Look what it's done. It's turned everything up. So that's a problem. So what you want to do is actually have one here, but then also one behind it too. So that once you turn this up, it's only turning it up from that point onwards, right? But still, we have all this, um, but at least the first part is good, right? Um, so we've got these two dots here. Now we have to go to, where are we going to turn it back down again? Here. So I'm going to automate it here. So I'm gonna go here and click it here and here. So now this point onwards is going to have that kick drum intact. Um, and this part here, this middle line, we can turn it up or down depending on what we wanna do. So this is pre-effect. It's gonna be sending it up now by, um, let's take it up to 1.8 decibels, right? So suddenly we're going to have um, this. So let's just listen to how it gets more energetic in the chorus. You can hear the drums are much more energy. And the guitars are like much more exciting. The vocals are still cutting straight through the mix, sounding really good. Um, so it's not much of a difference, 1.8 decibels, but it makes a lot of difference in like the emotional connection of the audience to the song. So we can go through and do all of that. Um, but I'm uh, too lazy to do that, so I'm going to actually open what I did yesterday and show you um, the end session. So you've also got this. So you can see here, I've done all the automation. I've already put that in. So um, zero, 1.82 or whatever for every part. And then at the end, I've just got like a little bit um, less and then back to 1.8, whatever. So let's have a listen to it. This is what it sounds like. Doesn't sound bad for a uh, just a demo, right? Yeah, it's got a lot of energy in the chorus now. Before it sounded a little bit more lackluster, right? Oh yeah, check this out. I automated the panning left and right for these whispers. So trim, that's where automation is. It's always good to like accentuate something. Like if it sounds creepy, make it creepier. Yeah. 
So that sounds really good. So at this point, I would be listening to the whole thing, just listening back to see if there's anything I might have missed. Um, and yeah, once it's done, like it's pretty good. So if you follow all of these steps, like what we've done last week and this week, um, you're not going to have any problems. Like notice that there's no red dots on any of these tracks. There's no clipping, you know. Um, and also the master is not clipping. Like we've done everything in such a way that that's not a problem. I remember when I first started out, um, I was just like, I was just not, you know, I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. Right. And like, everything was just like red. <laughs> and like, I was like, why does, why does everything sound so bad? And like, um, not understanding what's going on, but like, now that I've got this method, everything just works really well. And actually just to clarify on clipping individual tracks, if the meter clips on these tracks, like this, for example, um, right here, ah, that's not even going to do it. Hang on. Let's do it on the kick drum. Oh, that's not even going to do it. Anyway, if these if these get up to a point where they're clipping, um, uh, or they they have that red dot up here, um, they're not actually distorting. Um, these individual tracks don't distort individually. Um, we've done everything in such a way that it's not going to do that even. Um, but yeah, like even if even if it does hit that red, it's not going to distort. The plugins themselves can distort. Fab filter um, specifically make really good plugins that don't um, that also don't uh, distort when they get to that clipping because they're not actually clipping. Um, but something you can never avoid is the master track. If this goes red, you're definitely clipping, and it's definitely distortion, and it's definitely not good. It's always going to um, impede on the integrity of the signal, right? Um, so the last thing I would do once I've listened back to everything and done my final tweaks is I would um, pay attention to actually the, um, the meter reading on the master. Make sure it's somewhere between negative 10 and negative six. You don't want it to be any lower or higher than that because once you render it, once you um, export that final track, it's going to be, um, it's going to be compromised if it's uh, below 10. Like you're not going to actually have as much, um, it's like, you know, I don't want to, go too deep into it but like bitrate is a huge thing um it's like how how much definition is there in your dynamics like in the quieter part you know um and so like the lower parts of uh of a signal um are going to have less uh in like less uh, definition and uh once you get above six that's when you're starting to get close to clipping obviously like unless it clips like digital clipping is like a hard ceiling it's not like when you get close it starts like distorting a little bit or something like that um it's it's just one of those precautionary things try to keep it between negative six and negative ten um because once it hits zero it's bad and um less than ten is just like um in principle it's just not that good you know because um yeah of keeping like the high definition sort of sound right um cool so let's have a listen to a chorus this is the loudest part of the song you can see it's negative eight that's really good and if I was working with the band, I would actually put in a limiter. I'll get Pro L2. Pro L2 is a compressor, a compressor plugin that actually um, is a limiter. And I would pump this up until it's like the same as like a mastered track. And I would send the band that, right? Because like um, the band is often going to compare it against uh, their favorite band or something like that and say, oh, my favorite band is louder than our thing, but you know, usually like the band members won't understand that actually like uh mastering is when like volume of the overall thing comes into play right um and what we as mixing engineers do is like we try to get it to sound as good as possible before the mastering you know we're like mixing the song we're not like getting it to like this um radio you know presentable kind of a thing and also all that sort of stuff is like getting less and less relevant now anyway but um yeah for the sake of uh for the sake of the sanity of the band it's good to just like export it once with this like limiter set to the same as like whatever they said that their favorite um uh, album or song is from their favorite band um because yeah then you can just like uh be like yeah look it sounds the same volume um do you like the way the mix sounds you know um obviously it's going to uh, compromise the mix a little bit when you do this but it's also um it's it's going to compromise it in a way that the band isn't going to hear that well um because their ears aren't as tuned as ours are 
Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. And then I would turn the limiter off and export it again. Um, again, exporting it actually at the exact same settings as your project. So like here we've got um, 48 kilohertz um, and it's 24 bit um, for the uh, sample rate and the bit depth. So you just exported the exact same settings for the mastering engineer um, and the mastering engineer can do the um, the downsampling to 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bit, and they can do the dithering as well, which is another mastering process. Um, for when you change bit rate, you have to dither for, um, yeah, to make sure that uh, there's not like this, yeah, this thing happens anyway. Um, doesn't matter. It's really nerdy stuff that almost no one actually can hear. Um, but yeah, we're done. Like, that's it. That's the, that's the whole thing. Um, is there any questions? I'll also message it. I'm so happy. We actually, yeah, 522. I can't believe that I'm not rushing to finish this workshop. <laughs> This is like, I've done this, I've done this workshop, like, I think three times now, something like that, or four times now. And like every single time I've done it, I've um, gone over time or like gotten really squished for time at the end. So I'm really happy that that's not a thing today. Okay. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the stream there. Uh, again, um, this presentation has been put into the Google Drive, so you can access that if you would like. Um, if there's anyone watching this after the fact, you can also just message us and I will give you access to this presentation as well. Um, yeah, uh, if you like the band, you can go and support them. They're called Lead Inc. Um, they're from Germany and they are, I, as far as I know, they're still active. Um, and this song is just the demo that they recorded um, because, yeah, I've actually found the full album and uh, there's much better performances of this exact song on the album. So you can go and listen to that and um, buy their tracks as well if you want to buy their tracks. But for now, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you so much for um, joining us. <laughs>